السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد ونستعین ونستغفر ونؤمن به ونتوکل علیہ ونعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا ومن سیئیات اعمالنا من يهده اللہ فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي يا الله من فعاني بما علمتني وعلمني ما ينفعني وزدني علما اهلا وسهلا Uh, we are starting the next session of the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as usual let us recap the previous session uh, 53 which was uh, ghazwatul mu'ta it was known as ghazwa even though the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not accom- accompany the army particularly because it uh, involved actual engagement and quite fierce fighting Uh, the mushrik arab tribes within the northern region had amassed and recruited about 50000 fighters to fight the muslims but why did this battle take place at all the primary aim was re- revenge for killing of al harith ibn umair who was the envoy of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was killed by the chieftain of ghazanids Uh, Shurabil ib- ibn Amr al-Ghassani. This was the main reason, but it turned out to be for some other reason also. And this is the first time that three commanders were appointed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for this particular uh, mission. It, uh, he appointed them to take charge one after the other. So Zaid ibn al-Harith was chosen first. and after him jafar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and then abdullah ibn rawaha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu why did abdullah ibn rawaha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu cry he recalled an ayah from the quran that talks about the fire of allah it is in surah maryam surah 19 ayah number 71 regarding pulsirat the bridge over the fire of jahannam over which everyone has to cross then we had the reaction of abu huraira this was his first battle he got so overwhelmed on seeing the huge army and one of the sahaba tells him that the muslims did not win because of the size of the army alhamdulillah coming to the actual battle zaid ibn haritha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was martyred first when the enemy surrounded him and there was no way he could continue in the war the next was jafar radhiyallahu ta'ala who he took over from uh, zaid radhiyallahu ta'ala and who and he held the flag onto the flag even though both his hands were cut off and finally he was brutally killed and he also became a martyr Finally, Abdullah bin Rawaha, Rasulullah Taala, and who he took over, he fought very valiantly. At the same time, reciting enthusiastic poetry for which he was famous for, till ultimately he was also martyred. Now the next leader had to be chosen, and Khalid ibn Walid, Rasulullah Taala, and who he was chosen, who was the main strategist. Though he was a recent convert. he was chosen and his strategies his strategies helped in holding back the attackers and they stopped pursuing the muslims while the battle was going on an announcement was made by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the mosque the miracle in which allah removed the distance of the land from him so that he could actually see the battle and he was telling the people in the masjid of all that was taking place one after the other 
So the Prophet ﷺ welcomed the army while it was coming before it reached Madinah. His instructions to the Sahaba regarding how to deal with the relatives and children of those who were martyred. And we also looked into the Sunnah that we can derive from this. And finally, we came to the benefits of the incident of Mukta. Can we have the next slide, please? We are talking about Dat es Salasil. This is actually an area situated at about uh, 10 days walking, uh, walking distance from Madinah towards the north. It is said that uh, during this expedition, the Muslims encamped in a place with the, where, where there was a well, and some say it was a pond named Salsal. And hence the name of Datu Salasil has been given to this particular expedition. This took place a few weeks after Mu'ta. It was around Jumad al Thani, that's uh, the second of Thani, of the eighth year of Hijrah. It was against one of the relatively very large tribes up north, and that was the tribe of Khuda'a. This tribe of Khuda'a had actually aided the Khazanids during the Battle of Mu'ta. Why did the Prophet ﷺ decide on this campaign? In view of the alliance between the Arabian tribes on the borders of Syria and the Byzantines, the Prophet ﷺ felt it was utmost urgent and necessary to carry out a very wisely planned design that would bring about a state of relationship with these Bedouins also. And at the same time, it would separate them from the Byzantines. For the implementation of this plan, he chose the newly converted Amr bin al-As, who, whose paternal grandmother came from Bali, which is a tribe that dwelt in that particular area. With this motive in mind, combined with provocative military movements by Bani Khuda'a, this brought about his preventive skill a strike. Now, Amr bin al-As was a brilliant strategist and a very intelligent person when it came to diplomacy and international relations. You will recall that Amr who was a new Muslim from the nobility of the Quraysh. His father, Al-As, was a nobleman, though he was a pagan, and many ayahs in the Quran were there against him. Amr who was a nobleman by birth itself, and he lived a very luxurious life. And he was, as I told you, he was of the last converts before the conquest of Makkah. Since Amr Razila and who was among those who accepted Islam before the conquest of Makkah and he fought before this conquest, so this following ayah pertains exactly to him. If we go to Surah Al Hadid, Surah number 57, ayah number 10. And what is the matter with you that you spend not in the cause of Allah? And to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. Not equal among you are those who spent and fought before the conquering, which refers to of Makkah. Such are higher in degree than those who spent and fought afterwards. But to all, Allah has promised the best reward and Allah is all aware of what you do. What was the reaction of Amr ibn al-As when the Prophet ﷺ spoke to him? What is it that the Prophet ﷺ told him? He said, I want to send you on an expedition and you will get lots of money. Amr felt a bit insulted and he immediately said, I accepted Islam because I want to be a Muslim. I didn't do it for the sake of money. It was as if he was offended that the Prophet ﷺ was offering him money. This shows his sincerity. The Prophet ﷺ corrected his misunderstanding and said a phrase that should give all of us a lot of comfort. He says, O oh, Amr, how beautiful is pure money for a righteous man. 
how beautiful is pure money for the righteous man that is there is nothing wrong with having money and also wanting money as long as the man is righteous and the money is pure so these were the two conditions you cannot get haram money and the person who is earning this must be pious so from this hadith we derive that having and earning money is not wrong as long as the money is pure and you use it to please allah the believer is not someone who says i don't want money no rather we should all make the dua o oh allah give us a lot of halal money so i can spend it for your sake and use it for things that would please you amr rasulullah taala who he was given 300 men and he was told to give a surprise attack to the tribe of khuda it was actually winter time when this uh, expedition occurred so what did amr do he traveled only at night so that the enemy did not hear of his coming at night even though it was freezing cold he refused to allow the army to light a fire because they would become noticed when the group got near they realized that the enemy was larger in number being an intelligent person rather than rushing into the battle he sought reinforcement from the city of madina to be sent by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he sent a letter through the messenger to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to send reinforcements the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam responded i will also send you the best of people that i have what were the reinforcements sent by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the response of abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who to amr rasulullah taala and it's a very very interesting incident so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent reinforcements of 200 men and in this group were abu bakr umar and other major companions rasulullah taala and whom and in charge of this 200 was the famous companion abu ubaida amr ibn al jarrah rasulullah taala and who he was the one of the elite of the sahaba the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who when you get to amr make sure that whatever you do the two of you agree and you don't disagree when the reinforcements arrived it was time for the sala at that place and when the ikama was called abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who he went forward to read, lead the sala but amr rasulullah taala and who said no you are only a reinforcement and i am the leader this particular thing resulted in some tension because abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who was quite senior in every sense but amr rasulullah taala and who he said no i ask for enforcements and that's what you are i am in charge of the army and at the same time some of the sahaba who were there they were they took the side of abu ubaida and they said abu ubaida is our amir and you might be the amir of those 300 the which uh, you brought abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who immediately agreed to step down when he recalled the instructions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not to disagree with amr rasulullah taala and who so amr rasulullah taala and who he led the sala and he therefore became the head of the army he became the leader now we have auf ibn malik rasulullah taala and who he told the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about this incident of abu ubaida he said when abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who got there he and amr ibn al as rasulullah taala and who had a bit of a situation about who would be leading the army but abu ubaida rasulullah taala and who submitted and he fell in line behind amr leadership Allah revealed in Surah Al Furqan, Surah number twenty-five, Ayah number sixty-three. 
and the slaves of the most beneficent. They are those who walk on the earth in humility and sedateness. And when the foolish address them with bad words or uncouth words, they reply back with mild words of gentleness. Can we have the next slide, please? This is the map of the expedition that took place. As mentioned, Amr Razalwatala and who were 300 Muslims and reinforced by 200 Muslims, all of them, they attacked Banu Ada, taking them by surprise. What happens is Banu Ada, they flee without any challenge. Next slide, please. What are the lessons that we derive from this? In our entire Sira series, we are concentrating also on the lessons that we can derive for ourselves during the studying the Sira of the Prophet so that we also can benefit by it, inshallah. The first thing is, understand that the Sahaba are human beings. They are not superhumans, but then they are the best of humans. As humans, they battle the same emotions as a result of whenever there are tensions. Here, Abu Ubaidah Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu, he felt he was more qualified, but Amr Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu said the Prophet Sallallahu had put him in charge. In a sense, both were correct. Abu Ubaidah Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu, who was there at the Battle of Badr, Ohad, Khandakh, etc., and much more knowledgeable, still he agreed to step down, even though Amr was a new Muslim, new Muslim younger than Abu Ubaidah, Rasulullah Ta'ala Anhu. They were, the difference of age was nearly a decade. What a lesson for us. This is true leadership, to step down for the sake of unity. Next is Abu Bakr and Umar, Rasulullah Ta'ala Anhu, are better than Abu Ubaidah, Rasulullah Ta'ala Anhu. In terms of taqwa, in terms of status, in terms of seniority, and right up to the leadership. Yet what happened? The Prophet ﷺ put Abu Ubaidah Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu in charge. Thus, to be in charge, you don't have to be the best person of taqwa. The technical term is the leadership of the one who is not as good over the one who is better than him. In this case, Abu Ubaidah Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu is not the best over Abu Bakr and Umar Razalwa Ta'ala Anhuma. Yet, he is in charge due to military reasons. So, to have the most Iman is not always the best criterion for to the leader. We must keep this in mind. Unity is the greater cause and humility is the most admirable trait that we should have. It's not about me, it's not about him, it's not about anybody, it's about the cause that we stand for. What was the outcome of the war? Amr Rasulullah Ta'ala, who he led and coordinated the attack, when the tribe of Khuda'a saw 500 armed men attack them in complete surprise, they dropped everything and they fled. The Muslims did not conquer the entire tribe, because it was far too large to do this. But the message they sent was, don't mess with us. Fear was instilled in Khuda'a and much ghanima, that's the spoils of war, were taken in fulfillment of what the Prophet ﷺ had told. There were no major casualties. It was just a major financial victory, so to say, for the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who do you love the most? How did this take place? Related to this, a hadith of Bukhari mentioned a narration by Amr Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu. He said, when we get, got back to Medina, I was thinking to myself that I was in charge of the group in which there was Abu Bakr and Umar Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ put me in charge of them. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, who did you love more than anybody else? The Prophet ﷺ replied, Aisha. 
He replied, I wasn't asking about your family. I meant more so from your brothers. Who do you love the most from your companions? The Prophet said, Abu Ha, that is her father. The Prophet did not even take, mention the name Abu Bakr, just said her father. That's how much love he had for Aisha Razalwatala. Amr Razalwatala and who then asked, okay, then who? The reply was Umar. Then, okay, then who? He replied another Sahabi's name. As this was being continued, the Prophet was giving names of various Sahabi. And the list kept on continuing. Amr's name did not come up at all. He narrated, I got quiet, quiet before I ended up finding out that I would be somewhere in the end of the list. I decided never to ask, them, ask him this question ever again. Again, what lesson do we get from this? It's a lesson that we can really get. What we do is we fixate on the wrong things. What's more important is to focus on the task on hand and on the work that has to be done. We should worry, uh, worry very less bit regarding winning any favor, regarding having any position or being part of an inner circle or belonging to an exclusive club, becoming an exclusive member of a club. Instead, we should be worrying about those things. We should work, focus on the work that needs to be done. It's a beautiful lesson for us. May Allah guide us in this. Amen. We now come to Tayammum in the place of Ghusl. In the books of Hadith, we find an incident. Amr Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu narrates, it was winter and it was very, very cold. They were camping out in the open. Amr Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu, he woke up at Pajar time needing to take Ghusl, which is a bath of purification because he had a wet dream. But it was freezing cold and they were in the open. So Amr who he was afraid that if he tried to bathe, he might end up killing himself. That's how cold it was. By that time, the ayah of Tayammum had already been revealed. That you can practice Tayammum, that is dry ablution, by using sand or dust in place of water to make wudu. But what had not happened in this time was, there was no real example or precedent set for what if you do if you needed to perform ghusl. This was only related to wudu. And now in ghusl also, it is so cold, you can't use water, or water isn't available, then what do you do? Auf ibn Malik al-Ashari, Ashai, what he is, Razil Ratala, he had returned to Makkah a little bit before everyone else had come, and he gave the Prophet a complete report, debriefing of everything that had happened in the campaign. And one of the things that came up during the debriefing was that the Sahaba dealt with the scenario where they were not sure of the technicality. Auf Razil and who he told the Prophet, Amr needed to do ghusl, but he couldn't because it was so cold. But then he did tayammum and he also led the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ called him and asked, did you do this? Now, why did the Prophet ask this question? This shows us that whenever you have any information, you must verify it before you give your comments. SubhanAllah. Amr Razalwa Ta'ala Anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard Allah saying, that's in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 29. Have we not seen those who claim sanctity for themselves? Nay, but Allah sanctifies whom He pleases. And they will not be dealt with injustice except equal to the extent of their fatila. That is, you see, you see the date of a, uh, the seed of a khajur, date. 
that little thread that goes along with the stone or uh, the seed of the date, that is called a fatila. Even to that extent, Allah will not do injustice. Subhanallah. Amr Razil wa ta'ala anhu says later, I was worried if I took a bath, I would be killing myself. Therefore, I did tayammum and I did not take a bath. And he says, the Prophet Wasallam laughed at my explanation and did not say anything. He did not even rebuke me. He did not reprimand or correct Amr Razil wa ta'ala anhu. What do we observe from this? If something was done in the Prophet Wasallam's presence or something was informed to him and he didn't correct or reprimand it, then that automatically means that the Prophet Wasallam approved of it. Amr ibn Yasir, though this is not the Amr, Amr we are talking about, he narrated that the Sahaba were once on a journey similar to this. They could not find any water. So this man, Amr ibn Yasir, had to take a ghusl. So what did he do? He lay down on the ground and started rolling on the sand. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him and asked, Are you a donkey? Amr said, No, I have to do tayammu. The Prophet ﷺ said, That's not how you do it. You do it the same way you would do for wudu. Allah does not want you to do what you are doing now. Which shows that tayammum takes the place of usul, not only wudu. It's also allowed to perform tayammum even while water is present if there are legitimate reasons. What could they be? One is it's freezing cold. The second is if you have a skin illness and water cannot touch it. This also demonstrates that the Sahaba derived Islamic laws through their own reasoning. That's from the Quran. In other words, they did ishtihad. How to derive Islamic laws that are not explicit even when the Prophet was alive? The one who does tayammum is not in any way diminished in his capability of leading the salah. We don't care if one person does tayammum versus one who does full wudu with water. Makes no difference. We underestimate the practically of practicality of our religion. This is what happens. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ was presented with two options, he would always take the more practical of the two courses of action. Our deen is extremely practical. It is our thoughts, it's our own thinking that makes it so small and restricts our actions also. When folks feel that the deen is too overbearing, it's very difficult or it's impractical, more often than not, in fact, practically all the time, it is usually a case of lack of knowledge. Or maybe they are talking to the wrong people, which again leads to a, uh, relates to a lack of knowledge. Can we have the next slide, please? This is very interesting. Who did the Prophet ﷺ call Mr. Camel Meat? Another incident from the campaign of uh, Datu Salasil. This was narrated by Auf ibn Malik al Shai, Anhu. He returned to Medina a little earlier than the rest of the group, as I had mentioned before. The tradition was that sometimes when an army traveled, they would send someone ahead of the group to let everyone in Madina know that this group would be arriving in a few hours or so. And the Prophet ﷺ was very particular about going outside of Madina and welcoming this group. So he arrived in uh, pre-Fajr, that's before the Fajr time. This man arrived in Madina pre-Fajr and wanted to brief the Prophet ﷺ before Fajr itself. It was quite dark. And there were no lights at that time. So when Auf Razalatala and who he came near the Prophet ﷺ in the dark and he said salam, the Prophet ﷺ recognized his voice and said, That's Auf ibn Malik, right? Auf Razalatala and who he replied, Yes. 
then the, the prophet sallallahu said jazur sayyid jazur meaning mr camel meat jazur refers to camels that are sacrificed or slaughtered of rajadala and who he immediately said i would sacrifice everything for you ya rasulullah you never cease to amaze me if i hadn't didn't already believe i would believe right now who you are why was he so taken aback because something had happened with of rasulullah and who on his journey while he was back to madina and he had just entered the room of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was already talking about something that happened on the journey on uh, the journey of of rasulullah and who nobody knew but the prophet got to know about it through jibril alaihi wasallam so of rasulullah and who he narrated that during the journey he passed by a little tribe that was a small town there there were a group of people gathered around the town and what were they doing they were sacrificing some camels some of them were having trouble with sacrificing the camels and cutting up their meat they were fumbling around so of ibn malik rasulullah ta'ala who, who was very good at slaughtering and skinning animals he asked the gentleman can i help you they agreed actually you should not store meat the way you do now uh, at that time there were no fridges etc so typically from one camel about 10 households could feed from it and they would consume it in about a day or so before the meat would get bad now because it would be 10 shares of he what he said was i'll do this for you but i get one share that is i get one tenth of each camel share the men said okay fine you can have it this is actually physical labor the way they would divide up the camel for the purpose of meat consumption within their homes is a lot of there is a quite a lot 10 people would share a camel when he got back to his camp of rasulullah ta'ala and what did he do he whatever meat he had got he he cooked and prepared the meat he sat down and called whoever was around him including abu bakr umar rasulullah ta'ala who and the narration some narration say only umar was there and not abu bakr rasulullah ta'ala who while the sahaba were eating one of them asked him where did you get this fresh camel meat we are traveling we are on a journey how did you come across this so of rasulullah ta'ala and who he told his story he said i came across some folks who were trying to carve up some meat and they weren't so good at it so i gave them a hand and i took a share as compensation for the work they felt that for some reason that would be wrong some of the sahaba felt that it was a very unethical practice because you shouldn't take payment from the thing that you are working on itself so some of the sahaba became upset with of rasulullah ta'ala why would you feel this feed us this it wasn't right i don't think this type of a payment is correct there was a bit of a back and forth argument and of rasulullah ta'ala and he said i didn't mean to do wrong to you at all i'm sorry now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam assured of rasulullah ta'ala and who he said don't worry it's not a problem you didn't do anything unethical or wrong this once again shows the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam approving that particular transaction or incident that took place we now come to the second campaign that saiful bar it is notable notable for a particular reason uh, many of the sira don't cover this so i don't know how far but this is mentioned do not in so much of detail as what i have now abu ubaida rasulullah ta'ala who he was in charge of this particular campaign where he led 300 sahaba and they were sent to the shore lines to scout out that region and make sure that there were no forces gathered there to attack the muslims it was just an intelligence gathering mission not actual war as such jabir ibn abdullah rasulullah ta'ala and who one of the sahabi who participated in this campaign narrated this hadith 
uh, which you will find in the books of Bukhari and Muslim. And uh, they say it's also narrated by Ibn, Imam Malik. Jabir Razala Anhu, he said that when the Sahaba set out for the campaign, they had enough food and every day they would sacrifice animals so that there would be meat for everyone in that particular group. But the journey lasted longer than what was expected and they started running out of food. Abu Ubaidah asked everyone to gather all the food and the rations that they had put and bring it together in one place. Then what he did was, he started handing out the rations like five or seven dates per person. Can you imagine? Eventually, the rations ran, ran so low that each Sahabi started getting one date per day, one khajur per day. While Jabir Razalwatala and who was telling the story, his student, one of his students, Wahab Ibn Kisan, he stopped his teacher and asked, how would you survive on one date? How would a grown person survive on just this one date in a day? Jabir Razalwatala and who responded, we would suck on the date, like how a child would sit and suck on something. We would nibble at it. Then we would slowly, slowly eat it and make the most of it. We would drink a lot of water and try to live off that only. We understood the value of one date when we didn't have that anymore. A point came where Abu Ubaidah Razalwatala and who called everyone and this, he said, we are out of rations. It is Continuing this narration, he said, we were along the sea. The desert actually ran into an ocean. There was no food to be had. All day long, we somehow got through. And when we went to sleep at night, we were so hungry with the pangs of hunger, we just couldn't sleep. Some of the Sahaba, they pulled leaves from the trees, soaked it into the water, and they drank the water just to get something into their system. The situation became very, very difficult until one day they were at the shore and they saw a gigantic beached whale. But these were Arabs. These were actually desert dwellers. They had never seen a whale before. You have to kill the animal fresh for it to be halal. But the ruling with seafood is different. Some of them described the bleached whale as a small mountain. There was some confusion. What do we do? Should we eat of it or should we not eat of it? Eventually, Abu Ubaidah Razalwatala and who he said, a lot of folks thinks, think it's okay because it is from the ocean, it's from the sea, but they are not completely sure. At this point, we are starving to death. So as the Quran says, unless you find yourself at the brink of death, then you do what you have to do to survive. The group of 300 Sahaba, they ate from that animal for a whole month. Can you imagine? This whale did not have just meat on it. It also had fat, which we call blubber. The Sahaba would scoop up the blubber in buckets, <coughs> sorry, warm it up and rub their bodies with it so that they were well moisturized along with being fed also. What they did was, they took some of the meat, dried it after applying salt, so they had food to go back as well. After they had fully prepared to leave, they did a couple of things just to remember and be able to go back and tell the people how huge and unbelievable this particular whale was. And Abu Ubaidah was part of this entire setup. What they did was, they took two of the bones, that is the ribs of the whale, and made them stand upright like arches. Then a man sat on top of a camel and he rode under the arches of the bones. That's how huge the bones were. That a man sitting on the top of a camel could just pass through. This group made their way back to the Madina and naturally very well fed and well moisturized. The Prophet ﷺ welcomed them back with a smile. He told them to tell their particular story. 
every everyone heard the story and they said no way it cannot happen like this so the sahaba told the others of passing through the bones and everyone was amazed the sah- sahabi from the campaign told the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya rasulullah there's just one little question we weren't completely sure if it was okay for us to eat the animal to begin with we found that if we found it that beached actually that means it was dead so we weren't sure the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied this was the sustenance that allah provided for you do you have any of its meat that you could feed us then the sahaba gave the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the dried meat and he ate it and he said this is blessed risk that allah has sent us this incident is in surah at-talaq surah number 65 ayahs 2 and 3 the interpretation reads then when they are about to fulfill their term appointed either take them back in a good manner or part with them in a good manner and take for witness two just persons from among you that's muslims and establish the witness of allah that will be an admonition given to him who believes in allah and the last day and whoever fears allah and keeps his duty he will make a way for him to get out of difficulty and he will provide him from sources he never could imagine and whosoever puts his trust in allah then allah will suffice him verily allah will accomplish his purpose indeed allah has set a measure for all things we now come to the sanctity of human life there was one final incident that occurred in one of the sm- smaller battles uh, just before the conquest of makkah in which allah subhanahu wa taala revealed an ayah in the quran regarding this in a small expedition the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent a group of sahaba to attack one of the tribes that was threatening the muslims they passed by a person by name of amir ibn al adbat al ashja'i who is actually a secret muslim he did not disclose it to anyone in his tribe since the tribe was not following islam when he saw them he became so happy that he went forward and he said assalamu alaikum in the contingent of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there was a man who had a personal vendetta to this particular amir right from the days of jahiliya his name was muhallim ibn juthama muhallim refused to accept the salam and he said you are not a muslim and what did he do single handedly he attacked this man and killed him he took all the belongings of this man and he said he is just saying this he is not actually a muslim when the news reached the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa taala revealed the ayah in surah atul nisa surah number 4 ayah number 95 94 sorry o you who you believe when you go to fight in the cause of allah verify the truth and say not to anyone who greets you by embracing islam like saying assalam alaikum you are not a believer seeking the perishable goods of the worldly life there are much more prophets and booties with allah even as he is now so you were so were you yourselves before till allah conferred on you on you his favors guided you to islam therefore be cautious in discrimination allah is ever well aware of what you do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the intention of Muhammad. He didn't do it out of iman. That's what the meaning is. He did, he did it because he had a vendetta, he had a revenge and he wanted to take the all the belongings of this man. After this particular murder, there was a huge dispute between the tribe of Muhammad and the tribe of Amir ibn al-Adbat. Eventually they both accepted Islam. that is uh, after the battle of hunain uh, battle of hunain the chieftains they both came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and demanded that this murder has to be resolved both of them were angry the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to 
calm them down, he agreed to pay 100 camels on his behalf because he is the lead, uh, leader who sent this Muhallim. He gave 100 camels and the tribe of Muhallim told the Prophet ﷺ, why don't you ask Allah to forgive Muhallim? Listen to this. Why don't you ask Allah to forgive Muhallim? This is one of the very few times the Prophet ﷺ did not ask Allah to forgive someone. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that after a few days, Muhallim died. His tribe buried him, but the next morning they found him on top of the ground with his face down. They buried him again. The next morning, the same thing happened. This continued. Ultimately, the tribe put him between a valley, left his body there and threw stones on his body to cover it up. So he was not actually buried. The Prophet ﷺ, he said something very profound. Verily, the earth covers up people worse than him. His crime was actually not the worst. But Allah wanted to warn you through this man by showing you the sanctity of life between you. What a beautiful point. The sanctity of human life is so strong that you cannot just go around taking people's lives for a personal vendetta or anything and also accusing the person of not being a real Muslim. It shakes us up. We come to recap on Banu Khuda. Before we go to the next uh, part of the Sira, we must know something about this Banu Khuda. Let's recall a little of it. This tribe was related to the Prophet ﷺ and they had a history with Banu Hashim. They were the ones who expelled the tribe of Jurhum, which is the in-laws of Ismail ﷺ. And this Jurhum tribe was in charge of Makkah for a very long period of time. Initially, they were righteous people, but over the course of time, they became evil. They did a lot of crimes and started to steal the money from the Hujjaj. The tribe of Kuza fought them and kicked them out. I would like you to recall their chieftain was Amr in Ibn Luhay al khuzai This was the first man who introduced idolatry to the Arabs by bringing an idol named Hubal into the Kaaba from the Amalekites of Syria. I have mentioned this in the earlier series. Khusa'a was in charge of Kaaba for nearly 300 years, this particular tribe. Husay ibn Kilab, the great, great, great grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, took the Kaaba back from the hands of Khusa'a back to the Quraysh. He married the daughter of the chieftain of Khusa'a. So, the Prophet Sallallahu great-great-grandmother is from Khuza. The Khuza remained on good terms with the Quraysh and eventually Abdul Muttalib formed an alliance which they called as Hilf with the tribe of Khuza. Both the tribes will join together against anyone who causes distress or harm to the other. After Hudaybiyah, Many members of Khuda accepted Islam and joined the Prophet ﷺ in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. There was another tribe, Banu Bakr, one of the few pagan tribes in Makkah who had joined the Quraysh. The Khuza and Banu Bakr, both of these are located on the outskirts of Makkah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah came and both the sides split sides, the Khuza and the Banu Bakr. But still, they had revenge in their minds, especially for the Banu Bakr. Another reason was, this Banu Bakr believed more in the laws of the jungle. They had a particular code of conduct. That was, the tribes could raid the other tribes. They would try their best not to kill anyone. And definitely, women and children were spared. It was understood that every tribe has a risk of being attacked by another tribe. But at the same time, they try not to kill anyone. This Banu Bakr decided to undertake this type of a raid to get revenge of what happened in the past. But then they knew they had a treaty. 
So what they did was they sent their noblemen to the Quraysh and said, look, we want to take revenge. But since we've agreed to a treaty, can you give us permission to have just one raid? In the next session, let us look at the response of Quraysh. And what was the result after this particular thing? Inshallah, we'll see this in the uh, next session. Let's go to the duas, please. Allahumma la taj al musibatana fi dinina wa la taj al dunya akbar hammina wa la mablagh almina wa la wa la tasallut alaina bi zunubina man man la yarhamna. Sorry. Next dua, please. Allahumma bi almika al ghaybi wa khutratika al al khalq ahina. إذ كانت الحياة خير لنا وتوفنا إذا كانت الوفاة خير لنا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وزرياتنا خرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته